Good evening, everyone. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the adult program coordinators, coordinators at the Nantucket Athenaeum. And welcome to Yummy Monday. I see a lot of new faces. Thanks so much for coming. Tonight, our presenter is going to be Lydia Sussick. Um, while she makes her living in real estate, she has a passion for cooking and she's honed her skills while living in Italy and France. And tonight she has a couple recipes she, she's going to be sharing with us. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce and spotlight Lydia. Thank you. Um, thank you for coming tonight and welcome to my little kitchen. It's our tiny little house in Nantucket um, from the 1800s. And uh, tonight I'm going to be making, talking about making soup and the base for soups that you can use for anything else. Um, I think you're going to, I think Jan's going to share the recipes later, but I wanted to just read something which is from a cookbook that I really like that talks about chicken soup and, and thoughts about that. Anyway, um, homemade chicken soup is the very metaphor of motherly love the panacea for all afflictions encountered beyond the, par the parental threshold. It is the first sustenance I can even contemplate eating after a bout of flu. And every winter, there's a small stash of chicken stock in the back of the freezer, strictly off limits to the cooks of the family who might use it as stock for their own recipes. Unfortunately, homemade soup has taken a backseat to the canned variety, much of which is incredibly high in salt content, yet low in true flavor. There's no denying the convenience factor of commercial soups, and there's some very tasty ones available at the market, but they'll never, never equal your own efforts in the kitchen. They won't use up the bones from your Sunday roast. The meat tends to be over, overcooked, the fish rubbery, and the vegetables soft. In short, a can of soup will never be exactly to your taste. By all means, keep some basic canned soups on hand. Broths can serve as a basis for your own soup pot, and a few basic cream varieties help build quick satisfying casseroles. But for a soup that truly satisfies, take extra time and make it from scratch. Traditionally, soup is occupied only two places in the meal, the first course and the main course. As for its role as an appetizer, in the words of Renaud de la Reniere, the soup is to the dinner as the portico is to a building. At the first course, it must be concocted in such a way as to do justice to the feast, somewhat as the overture to the opera announcing the subject of the work. In other words, the soup must prefigure the meal, complementing, but not outshining the main course. Such lofty sentiments do not apply when soup is the main course. But even in this case, there's tradition to consider. Historically, a French soup was a smooth liquid, or not, often referred to as a potage. It was a broth based on meat or vegetable in or with something else, ranging from simple slices of bread to meats and veggies. This is part of a hearty peasant tradition along the lines of New England boiled dinner, pot au feu, or even turkey stew with dumplings. Finally, there's the latest arrival to the soup family, the dessert soup. Do not underestimate the power of such a sweet punctuation mark to bring a satisfied smile to the lips of every guest at your table. And that's that. So um, tonight I'm gonna to talk about a basic chicken soup. And it's a recipe that I have adapted from living in France as well as from my mother's kitchen. So the main ingredients that I'm gonna show them to you are right here. Um, you need to have onions and leeks. Let's see if I can turn this down. Okay, so onions and leeks, carrots. This is actually not for the soup. This is for the next conversation. Um, celery and carrots, and then tons and tons of coriander, which is also Chinese parsley, and then Italian parsley. So that's the basis for um, the broth that you want to cook. So before you actually make the soup, you can put these ingredients in your pot with uh, about, uh, if you have a large pot, which is what I have here, I use about eight cups of water and two leeks, two big carrots, a half a whole stalk of celery, an entire um, coriander, an entire uh, parsley. And um, 
Then I boil up those ingredients with the water. And I also added two short rib bones, which you can actually, if you like, you can saute onions first and with the leeks and then put them in, or you can do it plain as a boil. It depends on how you want to do it and how much time you have. Um, in this case, I don't know if you can see this, but I made a sample tonight. Let's see if I can, can you see that? So this is all the ingredients, including um, the meat, which it's nice to have a bone of any kind of meat. If you don't have a short rib, you can also use a soup bone, which any butcher can give to you. Um, anything with marrow, and there's a lot of research that's happened about marrow and bone broth soups, which are very he healing. So um, that is the basis of my soup. I boil up the vegetables and add the meat and let that boil for about 45 minutes. And then at the very end, I put the chicken in because my mother taught me that if you boil the chicken the whole time, it will become rubbery. And she actually cooks it in the way that the Chinese chefs cook it, which is au point, which is almost undercooked. Um, I prefer to cook it for at least a half an hour, but you can, if you have small pieces, you can do it that way. Um, another tip, if you don't have access to a full chicken, you can use chicken wings, which is a lot of chefs and restaurants just buy chicken wings to do their soup stocks because it's easy to get and it's less expensive. Um, if you can splurge and get organic chicken, it really does make a taste difference. So I constantly um, try to seek out, when I'm going to make a soup, I seek out a, an organic chicken. I'll show you a small one. This is, this is not a large chicken. It's actually maybe two pounds but you can get this at the Stop and Shop or at the Nantucket Meat and Fish. And it's worth every penny because it just really has a great flavor and it changes the whole structure of what you're making and it's fresh. Also, organic chickens come with the giblets inside. So I know it's not, some people don't like the giblets, but if you put them in the soup and then take them out after about 15 minutes, you're really going to get a good flavor. So that's, that's one of my tips. Um, Another thing I like to do is once I have that chicken base is I strain it and I chill it and then any kind of fat that came out of the meat will rise to the top and you can just pull it off with, with a fork or a knife. Um, if you don't have time, you can take a, a paper towel rolled up into a cone and you just dip it and it'll suck the fat out. That's a, a fast version of taking out the fat if you're serving at that moment. Okay, so that's a, that's a base. Another soup, which I discovered um, this year, last year, is uh, something called zupina verde, which is a soup that has a vegetable, all green vegetables in it, and you can use a chicken stock. If you're a vegetarian, you can use um, a vegetable stock. Now, to make a vegetable stock, you would just do all of the first steps I talked about and go a little heavier on the onions and the leeks. Um, you can also add salt and pepper to your taste. Um, and one of the secret ingredients of uh, the soup that I like to make is cumin. Uh, there's also different package, packages of herbs you can buy that go into soups. Um, the Middle Eastern version that has cumin in it also has cloves. That's something very delicious and it, it really makes the soup taste delicious. Um, my sister-in-law who lives in Western Mass turned me on to uh, raw, well, actually it's, it's fermented miso. So I don't even see that, if I can hold it to light. So this is something that if you don't have access to other herbs, this will make any vegetable broth taste amazing. And it doesn't really turn into a Japanese miso soup, it turns into a hearty base for any kind of um, recipe. Okay, so getting back to the zucchini verde, I would put um, two leeks, one large onion. I would put a whole thing of garlic, a whole entire clove of garlic, um, one whole bunch of celery, a whole package or a whole giant bunch of uh, spinach, which actually goes in at the end. Um, sweet potato, which is an unusual 
item for soup. Uh, it has white pepper and some cumin, salt, and extra virgin oil. So basically what you would do is saute all of the ingredients, uh, the onions and the leeks with oil. And then you would add your vegetable stock. It's got four cups of vegetable stock or you can use the water uh, or the chicken broth. And um, you basically cook the onions till they're translucent. And then you add all the, uh, the other ingredients. Um, and at the last minute, after you've done all of that boiling for about 30 minutes, you add the spinach and the peas. And then you take it off and this is what it looks like. And once it cools, you actually can put it in your blender and it's complete, it'll be totally, it's hard to see this, but it will be totally bright green. If you can see that there. So that is my favorite new soup of the year. And I made it when my son had his wisdom tooth pulled out this summer and he couldn't eat anything. <laughs> so that's how I got the soup recipe to happen. And it, it's become our go-to and it also has, um, it's delicious and you can eat it cold or hot. Uh, another thing that people like to add into soups, once you have that base going, either the vegetable or the chicken, you can add potatoes. Um, you can use a russet potato. And sometimes uh, I'm in the mood for potato and leek soup and you can, um, Translate that into a cold vichyssoise by adding cream, which you can eat hot or cold. And, and those are some of my favorite bases for soups. Um, now, the other thing we were talking about tonight was salads. Now, when I have soup meals, I always like to have salad with it. So my favorite thing to do with salad is I love to have fresh greens. And I sometimes just oven, I throw in the oven and some extra virgin olive oil, some vegetables. So these are car caramelized vegetables with olive oil and garlic, a little salt and pepper, which I've done on just a plain cookie pan. And when I make my salads, I used to, I usually like to have um, hazelnut oil or some kind of very nice olive oil. This is actually available at Glidden's and all the other and the 167 has it. It's uh, Sonia Toscano, which is from my friend Federica, my little sister. Um, on my different travels to uh, stores, there's a, a store called, called Sofra, which is near, which is in Cambridge. And they have a spice that comes in this called Duca, which is um, a blend of sesame seed, hazelnuts, coriander, toasted coconut, black pepper, and some other things. And it's really great with salad. I also like to, to use it on fish or, or on um, vegetables in the oven. It's one of my favorite things to cook with. Um, another, Williams Sonoma has something called Gabby's to go blend. I don't know if you can see that. And that also comes in a jar. You can order that online. And uh, lately I've been getting into drying my own herbs. So, I've been oven dry, this is parsley and I have sage from my garden. So at the end of the season, I've been just putting them in the oven at 200 and letting it go till it's crunching. So I will, I'll crunch that up on, on the uh, soups, on the uh, soups and also on my salad dressing. Another ingredient, which is really, really important to my soups. And I think it's in the recipe, but I, I failed to talk about it is turmeric. turmeric. So turmeric is, it looks like, gin, this is actually ginger and here's turmeric, it's another root. And you can get this fresh, um, I believe the Stop and Shop has it fresh. You can uh, find it in the corner. It's a different, it's a game changer for your soups. It also gives you a nice color and it's very healthy for you. You can also make teas out of this. A lot of people are making uh, turmeric lattes. You just, um, you can boil it up with milk or ground it up with a little um, planer into your milk and then strain it, add some honey, it's really good. And those are my uh, base, basic recipes. Um, on, in addition to that, I sometimes take uh, tomato paste. So I'll take um, tomato paste with my olive oil and a little bit of um, extra virgin olive oil with the balsamic and that will make a little red color to the dressing, or you can do uh, 
mayonnaise with that as well and have a little bit of a Russian dressing. Okay, so those are my basic tips. And Janet, do you want to open, open up for questions or do you have any questions about it? Oh, I have lots of questions, but um, I will open it up for anyone else that has questions. So you can um, go ahead. There's not too many of us here. So um, if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself um, and ask a question, you're welcome to. I think I see me has a question. No, maybe not. Okay. Um, so I have a question. Um, well, it's kind of like one of the two things I make a big thing of soup, but it's just me and my boyfriend. So how long do you keep soup? Like if you were going to keep it in a fridge and eat it over a couple of days and um, what are some ways to freeze it and how long does it last? Okay. So I actually, after I make the soup and I strain it, I put it into a Tupperware or a jar and I can keep it in the fridge for up to five days. Mm -hmm. If I don't think I'll use it, I'll stick it in the freezer. Um, and you can use, I actually have in my freezer different soups, which I'll use as bases, um, or if I'm in the mood for, you know, a hot soup. Um, and that, that can last a really long time, months, months, probably six months. And I, I just always try to put a tape with a date on it. So I know when it's expiring. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, the other question I had is like, I don't blend my soups because it always feels like such a mess. So I always do kind of hearty soups, but do you have any like recommendations if I want to blend it? Like what products are good or appliances make it good for blending? Well, I've been using just my blender, although I have a Cuisinart. Uh -huh. You can also get a hand blender, which I don't like to use. I think it's a mess and I always feel like I'm going to get burnt, but sure. uh the main thing is not to burn yourself. If you're if you're blending the soup, like this soup, which I'm waiting for it to cool completely because I have poured it into the blender and then I almost hurt myself <laughs> just touching the, the glass of the um, blender. But blenders are made to go with hot food if you, if you needed to. Um, the other thing is you can hand chop everything very finely before you put it in if you don't have a blender. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, does anyone else, I see a few people unmuted. Does anyone else have any questions for Lydia? Let's say Hi, Lydia, it's Amy. Um, I have a question about the chicken soup because first of all, how long do you cook it for total? I know you put the chicken in at the end, like three hours or how many hours do you cook the chicken soup for? I actually don't cook it for that long. For, for me, I boil up the vegetables for about oh. a half an hour to 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And then I put the chicken in for a half an hour. So in total, it's not really that long. And then I turn it off and I let it sit. So it's, some people think that you have to cook for hours and hours. If you wanted to reduce your stock, if you're making a soup stock, um, a reduction, then you would strain your soup and then boil it down to half of what it is. You'd let it, you'd let it boil and the water vapor would come out. That will give you a stronger stock. And if you're doing a consomme, like a French consomme, a, a lot of recipes call for that to be boiled down. But I don't really need, I don't like it to be boiled down. Um, I love the broth as it is. And, you know, sometimes I'll throw in some noodles or rice or, um, you know, have it with some bruschetta on the side or some nice Italian bread. What about um, the, you said about the giblets. I, it was funny because yesterday I made mushroom soup and I've never left the giblets in before and it was so good. And then Marty and I realized that we'd left the giblets in and, and it was just an accident. So is, is that something that you usually always do? Cause I, I never did it before. And then it was really good when I did it. I always so. try to put giblets in and sometimes chickens won't come with giblets. You can buy, you know, liver, or you can buy extra giblets, some stores sell them, but um, okay. I like it. I think it gives a more rich flavor. But obviously if you're vegetarian, you don't wanna do, um, you're just doing it with uh, other vegetables. You wouldn't even be using the jellies. 
Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to try putting the chicken in at the end. Now I've never done that before, but I always end up having to throw the chicken away and it seems like a waste. So I'm going to try that next time. Well, you can enjoy the chicken and, you know, I usually take out the poached chicken. You can, you can slice it it sandwiches or you can make chicken salad. That way you enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Elizabeth, you had a question, right? Just, just a comment. I think um, so many, the chicken soup, I agree with what you read from the cookbook. Um, it's just such a basis for comfort for so many people. On occasion, I find sometimes I add a, if I really feel like I want a heartier, um, I mean, Jane, Jan, I think you said a heartier soup. Sometimes I'll throw chickpeas or white beans in mm-hmm. as well, just to really oomph it up a lot. Um, anyway, just a comment, but I want to know, um, go back to that fennel anise. What were you going to do with it? Oh, okay. So the fennel... Yeah. And let me just, I wanted to just write down another recipe, which I'm going to give you black bean, which is my go. favorite food, in addition to chicken. So mm. the fennel, I like to, I have a mandolin, which my husband bought me, which is amazing. But if you don't have a mandolin, you can have just a sharp knife and you can cut the fennel, you cut off the top of the fennel and you take off the outer layers. You wash it. And you just want the inner white pieces and you make it very, very, very thin, like almost paper thin. And then I serve it with blood oranges. Citrus. So blood orange or any kind of orange, you basically cut around, you cut off the uh, outer layer and you just have the flesh and slice that up and olive oil. So olive oil, salt and yeah. fennel with orange is the best Italian salad. And that's something that's <laughs> traditional for middling. And it's very, very easy to make all year round, all year round. Yeah. And I missed it, Lydia. What do you do with the or- the oranges? You slice them or you- Basically do- cut the peel off. So you have a round ball. You just basically pick, with a paring knife, take the entire peel off. Okay. And then you can cut that into slices however you like. There's really, there's usually no seeds in that in that orange, mm-hmm. or you could just use a regular navel orange. Mm-hmm. You wanna make sure you have some kind of sweetness mm-hmm. and then you just use extra virgin olive oil and toss it and do it at the last minute because it's not something, it, it, can, um, it can last a few hours, but you wouldn't wanna do it early. Mm-hmm. Mm. It would get wilted. Okay, so Elizabeth Henry just reminded me of one of my favorite recipes, which um, is black bean soup. Now I take, Four cups of the chicken stock, and I will take. I actually make my own black beans, but if you if you don't want, to, you can buy the can and just drain it, so you can rinse it out and throw it into the soup, into the um, into the actual stock. And then I have these peppers, which I I forget what they're called, but I'm gonna find them. Okay, so these are. This is the brand, but you can get any brand. It's chipotle peppers in adobo sauce. So if you actually like spicy soup, you can use the whole can. My family doesn't like it too spicy, so I'll use half a can, but the can is very small. It's only um, seven ounces. And what you do is you toss in all those ingredients and you cook it until the, uh, it, gets, it gets very thick. Even though you have liquid, the uh, beans make it very thick. You boil it down a little bit. And that's one of the best soups I've ever made. It's so easy. And you can use it with a vegetable stock or a chicken stock. And then I serve it um, with, if you have tortillas, with guacamole and some sour cream or um, salad. It's a really nice meal. Lydia, do you have... No, I was just going to say, do you have a question, Gina? (laughs) Yeah, actually, I'm just wondering if you have sort of like a go-to homemade salad dressing like something that that goes with pretty much almost everything easy to make yes i do um i take my favorite is a vinaigrette that has fresh garlic so you would take one or two cloves of garlic a teaspoon of salt an entire lemon which you would squeeze without you know get make sure there's no seeds um a tablespoon of honey and you have, and I think you put in um, a teaspoon of mustard. If you have the, the Dijon mustard, that's great. If you don't, you can use any mustard. 
So you stir that up, sort of whip it up so it becomes a, like a paste. And then you drizzle in a full cup of extra virgin olive oil. And that's something that I use and I keep in the fridge. It, it, will, um, it will harden in the fridge. So you have to take it out about a half an hour before your meal. If you're in a rush, I've sometimes put the whole jar in a hot water and that will melt the oil, but it does get hard once you put it in the fridge. But that lasts about, um, about a week or two in the fridge. And salt and pepper, you can put pepper if you like. But that's my favorite salad dressing and I use it all the time. Lid, I'm sorry, was the first ingredient, sorry. <laughs> oh my God. It's okay. Are so you there? <laughs> I'm so, just kidding uh, my phone. Um, is, was your first? One to two, your, oh, thank you, Jen. One to two cloves of garlic, one teaspoon yes. of salt. I use kosher salt with everything, by the way. Okay. Uh, a full lemon. Mm -hmm. And uh, honey is that a, a tablespoon of honey, tea, mm -hmm. teaspoon to a tablespoon of honey, it depends how you like it. Mm -hmm. And um, then stir it up. And then you drizzle, you basically use a, a whisk or your fork in a bowl and you, you drizzle in the oil, and that will emulsify the oil. That's Sorry. what I was going to ask you is like about how much olive oil would you I, I put in? I use a full cup. I use oh, a you use a full cup. Okay, okay. That's and you can also missing. put, if it doesn't emulsify right away, you can put a little bit of water, like a teaspoon of water in it. That will help. Mm. Yeah. I have a comment. A whisk, Lydia? Do you just use a whisk? I use a fork, but you can use a little whisk. I use oh. it. I just use a fork. Oh, okay. I think Marsha has a comment. Yeah. My name is Marsha Jamil. I have a <laughs> comment about, uh, I'm Marcia. about stock. Hi. If you take bones, Fill a whole entire, like a 16 ounce pot if you have them, fill with bones and you cook them down and down and down. And when, you put, when you're close to finished cooking, they'll be about an inch in the pan. Take out the bones and continue cooking it until there's a syrup about like, it'll be like Hershey's syrup, maybe a little thicker. Mm. And this is what in the 18th and 19th centuries, French cook chefs used as the basis for their soups. Wow. So if you have a tablespoonful of this black. Uh, it's like a demi glass. It's so like wait, glass. is this, is yeah, this right. from the bone, the bone broth that you talk? From the bone? Bone broth. You, bone broth, you just keep yeah. boiling it, boiling it, boiling okay. it. Okay. Like it how many, could you go with Marsha, like, would you, could you boil bones for a couple of days? I mean, the longest I've done it is about 24 hours. But I don't know. I just kept boiling. I can't remember. I just boiled stuff down until it got it got thick so enough that it was. I just did it once. It's not okay. really, you know. I, I I happen to like these chicken cubes, chicken soup cubes, or vegetable yep. cubes as a starter. Otherwise, I would have yep. to make my own. I guess. Right. So that's a good idea. I'm going to I'm going to try that. Okay. I just tried it once. I think it, it was, I, I was a long add, time ago. I should add on that uh, on that vein two two things. One is I sometimes get a barbecue chicken from the store. If you have a cooked chicken or if you've cooked a chicken at your home, you can use the bones from a cooked chicken to throw into that pot or or meat if you have if you've had meat uh -huh. cake or you okay. made some roast. Those bones are great to put in a soup a chicken soup stock. Great. Um, the other thing is I don't, I'm against bouillon cubes because I think they have a lot of salt. So yeah. if you wanted to make your own vegetable bouillon, I'll, I think I, I'll give, I might have given Janet the recipe. Yeah, it's you here. Can, you can make your bouillon. So you basically um, can make this into a paste and then you can keep it in the freezer and, and I put it into a freezer cube, you know, ice cubes Ooh. and then put it in a Ziploc and you can just take it as you need. But to make a bouillon, the recipe, which she, she'll share with you also, is three stalks of celery, coarsely chopped, one large carrot, coarsely chopped, a half a brown onion, coarsely chopped, one leek, the white and the green parts only, sliced, uh, three to four sprigs of parsley, coarsely chopped, one to two tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil, and two tablespoons of sea salt. So basically, you can put all of that into a blender or food processor until it's pureed, and that's that's actually the sauce. If you don't have a blender, you can take, you know, your knife and just chop, chop, chop and mush it all together. 
Mm -hmm. way to do it. But the blender would, would make it really into the consistency you want to freeze it. And that is something you can just, it's a shortcut to putting into your soup. If you wanted to get a soup going really fast and you didn't have time, let's say you don't have a full hour to do all these steps. You can throw that in the water. Well, the water and just, um, if you didn't have onions or something, you can get that started. Um, I, I have a question about that. Can, what about the opposite? If you, if you put it into a crock pot, could you actually do a bone broth in a crock pot, do you think? Do you know? Of course, yes, sure. Okay, and you would just That's let it go way. for a long time and- Is that Donna? Yes, hi, hi Lydia. Hi. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, I'm gonna do that. Really? Okay. Super easy. Lydia, I had one question. Um, do you use a lot of bay leaf or not? I don't bay use leaf. bay leaf. I have, I use bay leaf in my pasta sauces and in my, mm -hmm. soup, but I don't put it in a chicken soup for some reason. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I, why. I have, I've put it inside the chicken cavity to bake the, you know, to roast a chicken. I don't, is that with the lemon and the, mm -hmm. Time rosemary. I, I think it adds, I think it definitely is nice. Lydia, and, and I was surprised that you didn't have dill in your chicken soup. Do you ever put dill in the soup? I don't like dill in my chicken soup. A no. lot of people have dill in their chicken soup, but I think it's too strong a, an herb. I I like this, I like the smell of dill and the, I like using it with fish, but not in my chicken. That's interesting. I've never used coriander before, but I'm going to try that. The, you use a lot of that in your chicken soup? The cilantro. Yeah, I take a whole bunch of, of coriander, yeah, or cilantro, uh, okay. an entire bunch. Some people just use the tips and then save the leaves for salad, you know, for other uses. The, the actual flavor, I think, is more in the stalk than the leaves. Okay. Um, the other thing is a lot of people don't like the mess of the herbs. So you could, if you have a little muslin, you know, you can get that at any store, any, any stop and shop or any store has that, um, just like the cheesecloth. You can just tie it up into a, a knot and use, put all the, it, all the herbs that you want in there so that they don't get into the soup. So you don't have to fish them out. You don't have to strain the soup afterwards. Oh yeah, and the soup. Yeah. <laughs> Who else has questions or comments? Okay, this isn't so much a, a, a question as a request. Can you tell us a little bit, because you went, you were telling me earlier, you when you were in France, you would travel on the weekends to Southern France. Yes. To, can you tell us a little bit about the markets? I just want a little bit of escapism. Can you tell us about the okay. markets you went to and what you learned in terms of like shopping and what to look for and what it was like? Yes, well, my 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 mentor in the food world is a woman named Denise de la Cour who lives in the Loire Valley. And I lived in Paris um, for about two years. And every Saturday, I took the train to the, to the Orléans station. She picked me up and brought me to the outdoor markets, which had everything you can imagine, cheeses, every kind of fish, any kind of bread, any kind of meat. Um, so she taught me how to look at a mushroom and see what's a good mushroom, what's over overripe. Uh, how should a liver look? How, what makes a fish fresh versus, how do you tell if it's a fresh fish versus something that's been sitting around for a long time. Um, so she taught me how to pick vegetables and cheeses and things. And we would spend about two hours shopping every Saturday morning. And then we'd get to her farmhouse and we would, uh, and she, by the way, she was a, her parents had a restaurant. So she'd grown up in a kitchen and her husband's parents had a pastry shop. So between the two of them, it was a very decadent experience. And so we would cook from about noon until 6 p.m. And then all of the friends would come over from the neighborhood and we'd sit down at the table. Um, she had a wine cellar, which in the Loire Valley, they, um, they don't buy cases of wine. They buy barrels and they share them with friends. So just like you'd split a case or you'd go and buy a case, um, they had bottling machines. Everyone has a bottling machine and everyone buys by the case. 
So we would go down to the cellar and pick the wine based on what we're eating. And it was a really joyous experience. Mm. And uh, yeah, fond memories. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, Katie agrees. Katie agrees. <laughs> Uh, we had a Loire Valley wine for dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> There's Beth English. She, Beth has um, one of the best stores to buy wine because if you want to try new things, she buys from small producers and it's, it's great, current vintage. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, beautiful shop. Thank you. Nice to see y'all. I just dropped, I, I did it earlier, but I don't know if people can see history, the history of chat if they joined a little bit after we started. So I just put a PDF in the chat that has all the recipes that uh, Lynn talked about tonight. I was just gonna look through. Um, so we Could I not be on video? I just realized, we to just, should I just be an observer? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. They're tiny pictures. Nobody can see. <laughs> okay. I can't um, see anyone. Another, yeah. another soup, which is um, an, another, it's not a soup, is my favorite thing to make besides uh, chicken soup is I make chili. So I have a crazy chili recipe, which I could share with you, which uh, uses everything that you can find in the kitchen. It uses, um, you saute, onions and leeks and celery and carrots and then you add cans of whole whole peeled tomatoes and chopped tomatoes and then you add these you know these chilies and all kinds of chilies any kind of chili that you can buy uh, you have to be careful of the heat level i usually use two or three tiny very hot ones and lots of um, the poblano type and the um, hungarian which are not so hot um, anyway that's that's the um, that's the body, and then I use meat. I only use meat. I don't put beans in it. So I saute separately. About I'll do about three four pounds of beef, and then add, combine those things together, and just let them stew in. And that's something that that needs about three hours to cook at least, and it's actually better the next day. So I'll make it, then I'll leave it outside on the deck, and then the next day I'll. Um, warm it up and add a, a bottle of beer because there's something about the beer that breaks up the proteins and makes it because it's so thick by the time you get it back it loosens it up Interesting. and also some of the chicken stock yeah. how um i've been buying when i use the buy buy canned beans because i haven't figured out how to properly deal with dry beans can you give some tips on how to deal with so dry, dry beans? beans um you really need to soak them I think 24 hours. People say overnight, but I find that if, if I soak beans overnight, it's just not enough. They're dry, they're still dry on the inside. So so I'm so, so how long? More than overnight? Well, I do it overnight, then I dump the water out and I put fresh water. And I let it go for another 12 hours. So it's you know, it's almost a 24 hour thing. So if you're thinking about cooking beans and then yeah. uh, then you can add them to any stock. So you would just do them the night before and then the next night that you're ready to do your dinner. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions or comments? We're doing this just in time for the cold weather, huh? <laughs> yeah. Who's, who's going to eat all that soup you just cooked? <laughs> you. No, it's snow, it's snowstorm season. So yeah. Hey, Lydia, this is Derek. Hi, Derek. How are you? Um, you mentioned turmeric, and I just tuned in. Then, on it. tell me what <laughs> is turmeric. Okay, so turmeric is an orange root that looks similar to um, ginger. I'll hold it up next to ginger so you can see the difference. It's very, very small. Yeah. This is ginger, and this is turmeric. So it's much more orange. Yeah. And it's and here's a cross section, so you can see how how orange it is. Let's right. see. It's almost like a carrot. Mm. It's really, really orange. And yeah. that's an excellent addition to any soup. I, uh, I if usually you have a that. microplane, you can take turmeric and finely grind the liquid out of it, the pieces, and you can stew that in some uh, milk or almond milk or you know any kind of non 
dairy milk, you know, nut milks are really good with that. And a little bit of honey. And that's, that's a delicious drink. So sometimes when I get tired, you know, I have coffee in the morning, but in the afternoon I might have a turmeric latte. And uh, actually Lynn has that at the, uh, the coffee shop. If you, if you could put it in a big uh, pot of soup or stock or something, how much would you use? Because it can be a little over, overpowering, right? I only use, I would probably only use um, a little bit at a time for, for a drink, but for a soup stock, this, this is basically almost a half an inch okay. piece. I would use double that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't chop it up. I just throw it in whole. Okay. And you don't really taste it. It's not the strength of it you won't taste. Yeah, I mean, I, I think turmeric is fairly mild, although it is, can be fiery if you use a lot. So, and Lydia, would that be equivalent to like a tablespoon, do you think, if it were powder? I would use a teaspoon. I would use a teaspoon of dry, because dry is stronger. Okay, okay. Than the, um, good to know. Yeah, I definitely overused it at times. That's good to know. I, I use it in a smoothie. I put about a... a teaspoon in and then I put um, about the same amount of black pepper. Nice. Oh wow. That's well that's good for your blood flow and everything. Pe it, pepper is really good. It is. With pepper. Absolutely. And yeah. I've read somewhere that pepper helps you take up the, the good stuff in turmeric. Oh it probably does. Yeah. Any, any peppers, um, peppers and mushrooms are very, very good for your um, blood pressure and also uh, is a diuretic. So a lot of people are afraid of eating hot peppers, but a lot of the Asian food diets, uh, they talk about that. You can even, if you're at a Chinese restaurant, it's even in the menu sometimes as to how the benefits of the pepper. But mm. if you can heat, it's really, it's a good thing. And, you know, even uh, a lot of the health food stores have, you know, you can take a shot of pepper juice which oh, really? uh, I personally won't like, but don't like, but, uh, you know, ginger, if you, if you have a cold or, you know, people with COVID, you know, having extra ginger, extra Gar yeah, hot, garlic, cayenne uh, pepper, garlic. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Those are remedies. And I actually bought this at, uh, let me show you this. This is interesting. I got this at Roasted from Lynn. This is a first aid. First aid honey, mm. and kind of like an echinacea based honey. It's got raw, it's got raw honey, elderberry, ginger, turmeric, garlic, lemon, echinacea, mullein, lemon balm, and burdock. Mm. This is at, available at Roasted. If you can see the label. First aid, good name. First aid, yeah. Huh. So, and I like it. I'm a big believer in- Especially uh, during this pandemic. <laughs> But even in the winter, if you feel like you're catching cold, if you take elderberry juice, it'll knock it out. You won't get sick. It'll basically knock it out that day. So I bought this as a something to ward off the badness. But you can make it yourself. You don't have to have this brand. You can just add all these, you know, you can add some of these items into your own honey. Beth, you have a question. You've had, you had your hand up. Um, yes, when uh, Lydia, when you were talking about chili, um, you said comfy tomatoes. Is that like the ones that Federica sells? Those um, the well, cans the comfy tomatoes. tomatoes I wouldn't waste in chili. The ones that okay. she sells that Sonia Toscano has, they're dry. They're almost they're almost sun baked tomatoes. They're sort of they're not they're not sun dried tomatoes, but they're sun baked. They're, they're practically they're in they're almost sugary tomatoes in olive oil. And uh, I'll show you what they look like. I have some here. Hey, mom. Love you, mom. <laughs> hey, Johnny. <laughs> that you, Johnny? These are the these are the semi-dry yellow tomatoes that she make that they sell. These are from Vesuvia. They're hard to get, but she gets them. But I use just regular canned palati, peeled tomatoes that you can get in the store. Um, and with the chili, you don't need to use a gourmet brand. You can just use even Hunt's tomato, chopped tomatoes. Although I use the Italian ones just because I feel that I should. I feel they're, <laughs> I feel yeah. they're less um, acidic. 
than the American ones for some reason, but. Well, that's, I would do that too. <laughs> Any other questions for Lydia or comments? Well, I just, I think this is very helpful and it's like kind of having, uh, you know, your, your, someone just cooking with you in the kitchen versus reading, a, just reading a recipe. It's, it, it really helps to be able to talk about things because there's a lot of thinking around, you know, your own thinking around a recipe and it would be nice to have, ask questions. So anyway, mm -hmm. I like this um, way of doing it. Thank you. <laughs> And actually, Don is the person who, who turned me on to the uh, miso paste, the brown rice miso paste. But you can also get, at Bartlett Farms has different versions of those. Uh -huh. I got it on the island, but you, you can also get, they come in little tubs that looks like butter tubs. You can get white miso or brown. It doesn't matter if it's white or brown. They're, um, they're fermented. Fermented. Yeah. Fer yeah. So Lydia, my question is, will you be doing a bread baking cooking lesson? I'm doing that with you, <laughs> if you still have the starter. <laughs> I still have it. We have okay, to we better talk up. today. I've neglected the starter. Okay, it's still alive if we do it, like we have to do it tonight. <laughs> oh but I'd be, happy, I'd be happy to accept that I'm not the expert on bread on the island. Um, there are a lot more accomplished bread bakers than me. I, I just learned recently. Well, even oh. in the Julia Child cookbook, I don't think she has the recipe with the with you know a, a starter from a family. She starts from you know she starts it from yeast, I guess, because you have to do. You that. can start it from scratch from the air. Actually, you don't need the starter. The starter helps you to get to the next level. Um, and okay, okay, starters for years and generations. But yes. uh, no, I've been baking a lot in the last, uh, I, I only started doing the sourdough. I mean, I've baked bread before, but I only started the sourdough recently. Um, and oh. Ren Renee Manning, who is on the island, is a chef here. She's been, she's been doing um, bread baking. And I'll show you, this is, this is one of my breads, if you can see. Well, they've been beautiful, yeah. Yeah, they're pretty, I mean, she taught me how to do the whole process. And then this is my Christmas tree, which I think becomes, uh, that's the big version. And then, um, and then we've been experimenting with different kinds of pans. So I've come to the conclusion, I only have one, I, I left it in New York for my husband, but the Staub pan is even better than the Le Creuset, but any Dutch oven will work. But this is- um, Okay, interesting. That's my, Anyway, so I'm, I'm learning how to score and I'm learning how to do different types of bread. Yeah. Also, I just put in the chat, we had, and Lydia, I think you came to this one, Sean Reed, who- Oh, he's amazing. Here, he yeah. um, did a whole Yummy Monday on bed, bread baking um, that you can see on our YouTube page. Um, and if you email me, I'll put my email in the chat. I can send you his, um, uh, recipes. Yeah, oh, actually, great. Sean is amazing, and I've been I've been calling him a lot. We've been talking about bread a lot, and <laughs> Angela Rayner uh, is is big into bread. Yeah. So yeah. Great. We've been communicating just while I'm learning. I've been asking everybody their tips so that I find out everyone's um, different ideas because there's yeah. a lot, so many thousands of versions of of bread, sourdough bread, and other things. But uh, in fact, right now I have. Uh, I have, two, I have two loaves proofing in the oven. Well, the oven's off, but um, this is this is my sourdough. <laughs> How do you feel about bread bowls for your soup? Bread bowls? I don't really, you know, I think with the kind of soup that I do, it's too wet. Yeah. If you have chili or chowder, mm -hmm. you can do bread bowls. It's It needs something thick. And I guess um, you might want to toast it and put some some garlic on the inside of the bread and then some olive oil to hold it in. Yeah. But uh, I, I mean, I've, I've been to San Francisco where they serve that, uh, the, the amazing soup with the, in the bread bowls, but uh, <laughs> I like to eat on the side. Yeah. I, I'm more about 
you know, simple lip recipes, really using good quality ingredients. And you don't need a lot of fancy oils. You could just have one oil, your go-to oil and have lemon. A lot of the Italian food, just lemon and olive oil with salt mm -hmm. or just poached. But the Italian cuisine uses a lot of poached vegetables, um, just even like poached um, zucchinis and things that aren't even fried or, or, or oven done. Uh, and then they drizzle olive oil and squirt a little olive, a lemon on it. Mm -hmm. You can do the same with poached fish. Very simple. Yeah. All right. Well, we're just about at time. Did you have anything you wanted to add before we wrap up? No, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to share. And uh, I, I, I'm glad that we had this time. <laughs> if anyone wants to reach me, they can, um, they can get my number from you, Janet. Great. Happy okay. to talk about food ideas. And I should also mention, I've been working on a cookbook with, with all the recipes when I was living in France and Italy. Um, one of the things I did was anytime I was invited to dinner, I asked permission to come early and I took notes. So um, if somebody asks you over for dinner and you want to learn how to cook, ask them if you can watch. <laughs> Maybe you'll learn. That's great. Well, give us a shout when it's um, out and we'll have you back for an author talk. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully in the Great Hall, which I miss very much. We'll get yeah, back there someday, everyone. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Next Bye. Bye. Yeah, join us next week for Yummy Monday. It was so nice to see new faces. So have a great night, everyone. Thanks, Janet. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.